Today I'm going to discuss how to utilize EPDs in the selection of sires to enable genetic progress and to help meet your production goals. First, it's critical to start with a plan in mind, so clearly identifying what your breeding and marketing goals are. An example, do you, tend to do you intend to keep replacement females or rather is everything terminal? And if terminal, what is the desired endpoint? This helps you then identify what traits directly impact the profitability of your enterprise. We call those economically relevant traits, or ERTs, those directly tied to either a cost of production or a revenue stream. And finally, you need to clearly identify any environmental constraints. Those could be in terms of land, labor, or available feed resources. Let's start with some fundamentals. Phenotype is really the sum of both genetic and environmental effects. We can further break that down and say that phenotype is equal to the mean of a given population plus an animal's genetic merit or their breeding value plus any environmental effects. So if we look at these two animals here who both have a 600 pound adjusted weaning weight, they both come from the same breed or population that has an average of 550 pounds, the animal at top has a positive 10 breeding value and the animal at the bottom has a negative 5 breeding value. So although they both got to the same adjusted weaning weight, they got there in vastly different ways. The animal on top because he was genetically superior and the animal at bottom because he benefited from a, a superior environment. Consequently, when we're selecting sires, we want to select those who are superior genetically because it, because it is their genetic contribution that will be passed from one generation to the next. An EPD, or expected progeny difference, is really a numerical or a quantitative representation of the genetic merit of an individual as a parent for a given trait. In this example, we have five offspring from a sire all of them coming from different contemporary groups and you can think of a contemporary group as really a combination of a herd, a season, and a year of birth of the calf. So the first calf with a plus 30 was 30 pounds heavier at weaning than the average of his contemporaries. Three calves down was actually 10 pounds lighter than the average of his contemporaries at weaning. If we take an average of these contemporary group deviations we wind up with a plus 10 which you can conceptualize as, on average, how much heavier this sire's offspring would be compared to their contemporaries. So an example, if the breed average for weaning weight was zero of this particular breed, then you could say that this sire, who has a plus 10 EPD, on average, his offspring would be 10 pounds heavier at weaning as compared to the average offspring of the average bull from this breed. The other important note is, is that offspring of one sire exhibit more than three quarters of the diversity of the entire population. So another way of saying that is knowing sire accounts for one quarter of the additive genetic variation. So for producers that wish to increase uniformity of their calf crop, Really using a cohort group of bulls that are full siblings or even half siblings does not necessarily do this. Instead, they would be better served to actually utilize bulls that are more similar in the EPDs for the traits that they're interested in. Here I've represented EPDs as only being uh, uh, estimated using progeny information, but in reality, other information goes into that calculation as well, including the individual's own record for that trait, as well as pedigree information, so information from their parents and also any collateral relatives, such as their half-siblings or full-siblings. Unfortunately, EPDs are only directly comparable within a breed. The U.S. Meat Animal Research Center, U.S. Mark, publishes on an annual basis a table of additive adjustment factors that can be used to adjust EPDs to a common Angus base. You'll note here that some breeds have a gap or a missing value for some traits, and that means the breed either does not publish an EPD for that trait or the trait they publish is on a different scale. An example for marbling, some of these breeds may publish an intermuscular fat percentage EPD instead of a carcass marbling EPD. 
These values again are updated annually and current values can be found at the Beef Improvement Federation website. Here's an example of how these may be used. Let's assume we wish to compare a Simmental bull to a Hereford bull for the EPDs of birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, and milk. In this example, we could use the adjustment factors from the previous slide to add to the EPDs of these two bulls. And after we do so, we could then fairly compare them. You'll see that the, both bulls had an EPD within their respective breed association of 25 for milk, but after we apply the adjustment factors, you can see that in fact, they differ substantially for this particular trait. That's why it's important if comparing bulls of two different breeds to use these values to ensure you're actually making the correct comparisons. All EPDs are published with an associated accuracy value. Those accuracy values can range between zero and one. Z zero meaning we have no information to actually inform the EPD. One meaning we have complete information and we know it uh, without error. In reality, neither is ever the case, and in fact, accuracy always ranges between 0 and 1. The accuracy value we use is beef improvement, or BIF, uh, accuracy. Here I have illustrated the number of offspring it takes for an animal to reach a given level of accuracy depending on the heritability of the trait, where 0.1 is lowly heritable, 0.3 is moderately heritable, and 0.5 is relatively highly heritable. So you can see for a lowly heritable trait such as reproduction, for a sire to be high accuracy, so accuracy of 0.99, he would need 3,800 daughters in production with that fertility trait recorded. The benefit of having early information is to enable more accurate selection decisions before a bull ever has offspring, and we can do that now through the use of genomics. So genomically enhanced EPD actually benefit the commercial producer by helping mitigate the risk of having made the wrong selection decision. Another way to think about accuracy is possible change. Most breed associations publish a possible change table, so these values are dependent on the breed and also dependent on the trait. You can think of these possible change values really as standard deviations. So in the next slide, I'll show you how to utilize them. Let's take this bull, for example, that has a marbling EPD of 0.1 and associated accuracy of 0.2. That would be akin to a yearling bull, perhaps with an ultrasonic measure for intermuscular fat. From the previous table, we can look at accuracy of 0.2 uh, for the trait of marbling and find out the possible change value by chance also happens to be 0.2. So we can both add and subtract the possible change value from the EPD and build what we call a confidence interval. That confidence interval in this case is negative 0.1 to 0.3. So we can say that we're 68% confident that this bull's true EPD for marbling lies between this range. Practically, this can be useful for a trait like calving ease, where we may have an idealized range of calving ease, calving ease EPD that's acceptable to us. We can apply these same kinds of tools then to ensure that a bull that we purchase, uh, regardless of the accuracy of these EPD, is likely to fall within an acceptable range for us. The next slide shows genetic trends for weaning weight. All of these are placed on the same base, so they're directly comparable and they represent the genetic trends for the seven largest beef breeds in the U.S. You can see that through the use of EPDs, we've been able to increase the genetic merit of animals for this trait uh, over really the past uh, 30 or 40 years. Some breeds obviously have placed more selection pressure on this trait than others. But I wish to illustrate the fact that more may not always be better and really depends on your own production scenario. So these are the genetic correlations between mature cow weight and birth weight, weaning weight, and yearling weight. In example, if you select to increase weaning weight but keep back replacement females, you may get a correlated response such that mature cow weight increases over time and as a consequence, revenue, weaning weight, is pitted against cost, mature cow size. There are ways to mitigate this issue. We'll talk about means of multiple trait selection to help mitigate antagonisms. Another thing, however, to think about is actually selecting females from a herd, perhaps purchased from others, that are designed to be more conservative in size 
and then use, utilizing a different breed of sire that may excel in growth and carcass merit to produce terminal offspring. Obviously, breeds have changed over time in terms of mature cow weight. These are mature cow weights as measured either in the early 1970s or in the late 1990s and early 2000s from several different beef breeds. And you can see over that 25 to 30 year time horizon, all breeds have increased in terms of mature weight. But interestingly, we've seen uh, a dramatic increase in British breeds here, HA by AH or AH or Hereford Angus or Angus Hereford crosses. Uh, and so breeds perhaps that were once very moderate and mature sized British breeds uh, are now at least comparable uh, to continental breeds. So it's important when constructing a breeding program to understand the way breeds rank today and not the way they ranked historically. These are genetic trends for milk and again several breeds have chosen to increase this genetically over time while other breeds have elected to stay relatively constant if not slightly decrease. Milk is a nice example of a trait that certainly extremes are problematic. Uh, in extreme forage uh, limited environments, cows with extreme genetic potential for lactation uh, need more energy simply for maintenance because their visceral organ size is larger. So that coupled with the energy needed for lactation means that they may not have enough reserve left over for reproduction. These are results from a study that clustered animals into either low, medium, or high uh, lactation and then looked at income, expense, and overall economic efficiency, whether the calves are marketed at weaning or harvest. And the take-home message here is the low milk group of cows were more economically efficient regardless of the endpoint of the calves. So as a consequence, I think you can understand that more is not always better uh, either biologically or economically. There are two kinds of calving ease EPDs, calving ease direct and calving ease maternal. I think most people understand calving ease direct, but if you're somebody that generates their own replacement females, you need to pay attention to calving ease maternal when selecting sires. Here, I took calving ease scores and combined them into three categories where one required no assistance, two required some assistance, and three required a great deal of assistance uh, and possibly a cesarean section. From this, you can tell that cows that required a lot of assistance at calving were less likely to conceive, in this case, 11% less likely to conceive uh, 90 days uh, postpartum. There was an 11% decrease in that. Um, and so I think it's important to realize that calving ease not only uh, can be economically important because of the added labor required and possible mortality of cow or calf, but for those cows that do survive, there can be decreased uh, reproductive success. We do have some EPDs for metrics of reproduction. Um, these two represented here have for pregnancy and stability published by several U.S. beef breeds. A higher EPD is more desirable. Uh, and in the case of heifer pregnancy, here we could say daughters sired by bull A are 4% more likely uh, to conceive as heifers. And uh, from the stability example, we can say that daughters from bull A are actually 6% more likely to stay in the herd until age 6 and remain productive. The crux, however, is that we have a lot of data and sometimes not enough information. There are several breeds, a plethora of EPDs, and of course we all have slightly different production environments with slightly different variable costs. So the challenge is to make sire selection decisions as simple as possible. One way to do that is to use multiple traits selection using economic index values. An economic index is a collection of EPDs relevant to a particular breeding goal multiplied by their relative economic importance. So an example, if you are a terminal producer who uh, retains ownership through the feed yard and markets towards some kind of value-based grid, traits in the index uh, for you may include things like post weaning growth, uh, carcass weight, quality and yield grade, feed intake. But that would be dramatically different if you sold at weaning and retained your own replacement females. Here I have numerous examples of indices published by several different U.S. beef breeds. 
and I've delineated them as either being terminal or maternal in nature. Terminal are those that assume no replacement females are retained, and maternal um, or maybe general purpose realizes some offspring will be marketed while others will be retained as replacement females. So it's important to clearly understand what your breeding goals are so you can use the correct index and avoid un any unintended consequences. Here we have an example of how an index may be used. This is from Gelby's Dollar Cow Index, a more general purpose or maternal oriented index. And so if we assume these two bulls are going to be bred to 30 cows per year over a four-year time horizon, that's 120 exposures over their lifetime. We can multiply the number of exposures by the value difference in their indexes and determine an estimate of the profit difference uh, between those two sires for our particular operation. This holds if you follow the assumptions of the index in terms of the breeding goals assumed. If we wish to increase the profit difference between these two sires, the way to do that is to increase the number of exposures. So if you're a commercial producer, that may mean um, being able to custom collect him and breed him to more cows via AI. So it's important to focus and identify on those traits that are economically relevant to your given operation. And know that EPDs and economic index values are more valuable than an animal's own actual weights at generating response to selection or change. And in fact, research has shown that EPDs are seven to nine times more effective in generating response than selecting on an animal's own weight. So some helpful resources, the UNL Beef Production website, the National Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium website, beefefficiency.org, which focuses on genetic and genomic tools to improve beef efficiency, and ebeef.org, a website that focuses on uh, all things beef cattle genetics um, and designed for use by producers and extension personnel.